Uh, the, the next speaker will be Professor Timothy Rainers. He is the professor in the Department of Medicine, the Lee Ka Seng Faculty of Medicine, Hong Kong Univ the University of Hong Kong. He will talking something about the, the role for works in the emergency medicine education. Please welcome uh, Professor Rainer. Thank you very well. Uh, thank you very much, Axel. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, and you can, we can see your slides too. Yeah, uh, it's wonderful to uh, join this webinar this afternoon. Um, it's good to see old faces. You know, I haven't seen Colin for at least a week or two, and it's been a long time. And Gam Ying, probably 10 or 15 years, you haven't changed at all. So quite wonderful. And um, and then the so let's make let's make a start. The road forwards in emergency medicine education. Um, what I'd like to do is cover a little bit about the importance of education, uh, cover some definitions, um, recap some of the challenges, challenges which, in a sense, Colin has already mentioned, and intersperse with some lessons. Uh, I've got some anecdotes. Uh, I hope it'll go well. Um, the, the future, uh, I mean, who knows the future? It's, I mean, we don't know how to define normal today. So how can we define the future? But anyway, uh, hopefully there'll be a few things to think about. And so why is emergency medicine education important? Well, I'm sure that there are more reasons than the ones that I give, but it's vital for improving communication. Um, secondly, it's vital for improving critical thinking. When Colin and I started a master's of pre-hospital emergency care, about 15 plus years, about 15 years ago, um, one of the key objectives of the course, which was designed for paramedics, nurses, doctors, anyone who might, might be interested, one of the key objectives of the course was develop leadership and critical thinking. And one of the groups that we were serving when we shared this with the leader of the group, um, I'm not going to say which group, but we, uh, one of those groups that I mentioned, he said, do we really want to teach us our, our, our healthcare professionals of the future to think critically? What we want them to do is just do what we tell them. We don't want them thinking. Um, I never expected that sort of response, but as the years have gone by, I've come to realize I was a bit naive. Um, so why is education important? It improves competency, obviously. The better trained we learn, and it improves care. So these are just a few simple things, uh, foundations to lay. Of course, if we're going to talk about emergency medicine education, we need to define it. Um, this is the International Federation of Emergency Medicine definition of emergency medicine. And the focus is the field of practice focusing really on acute aspects of illness and injury, acute urgent uh, uh, and urgent aspects of illness and injury. And of course, it extends a bit further to pre-hospital care and sometimes some aspects of in-hospital care. Uh, but that's broadly the area that, that we're talking about. Now, there's a very interesting uh, publication back in 1984 in Science where um, a group looked at the impact of environment on patient experience. And uh, I think uh, patients undergoing a cholecystectomy uh, after their operation were randomly assigned to either a room with no windows or to a room with windows. And the group that were assigned to a room with windows got recovered significantly quicker than those that were assigned to a room uh, without windows. Other than that, the operation, the treatment, the characteristics were all the same, but the environment was very, very significant. Um, those of us who've uh, experienced quarantine after traveling in the last uh, year or two, I think most of us would not like to go to a hotel room that has no windows. Um, uh, for some reason, being able to see outside, to see the sun, the sky, uh, if you can see the water, that's good, the hills, but even if you're looking at concrete, 
uh, to be able to look outside is significant. So the environment is important. Uh, it's not just the content. It's the environment is important. And if we are going to improve emergency medicine education experience, we need to look at the environment. Well, Collins mentioned uh, a number of challenges, and this is really, uh, I suppose, to reiterate and maybe just add one or two others that are very common uh, for all of us. Recruitment and retention of teachers, same as recruitment and retention of staff, is probably one of the leading issues face facing all specialties worldwide, but also emergency medicine. Um, there are greater expectations upon us, less time, at least as far as we're concerned, we have less time. Actually, we probably have enough time. Uh, what our challenge is, is prioritizing the time that we're given uh, so that we use it efficiently. But uh, certainly it feels like we've got limited time. We, well, this is about me medical students rather than emergency doctors, but there's a, a vast increase in, in, uh, in expansion in student numbers medical student numbers, which is going to impact on education generally. And of course, Colin and others have already mentioned uh, uh, the relevance of COVID. So these are challenges that we're facing. When I was in Cardiff, uh, I, I spent a few years back in Cardiff a few years ago, I contacted our engineers and together we looked at patient flow and we looked at the emergency department. And uh, maybe this is obvious now, but at the time it was new to me that their perspective of emergency medicine, especially emergency department, was a complex human activity system. It's not simple. It's complex. Um, from the engineering point of view, they were able to break down various parts into simple blocks, but the whole is quite complex. We need to make quick decisions, and we often have limited information and have to come up with management plans for when we don't actually have a diagnosis. Uh, sometimes patients are sick, sometimes they're not, but this is our environment. Undoubtedly, the way forward is partly going to be with technology. Um, whether this is a good or a bad thing, uh, is an interesting point for discussion, but it's certainly going to be a fact of life. Um, uh, in the last year uh, in our faculty, I think all teachers have been encouraged to video their lectures or their presentations ready for the future so that uh, when medical students uh, maybe are no longer able to face, you know, attend face-to-face -face teaching, um, there we are. We give them the, the video, we tell them to go away and look at it. And um, so this is the future, virtual reality, cameras, uh, simulation apps. There's no doubt this is gonna be part of the future. It's not really a matter of discussion. What should be a matter of discussion is whether our medical students and emergency medicine trainees in the future are going to look at students and patients as things and apps and uh, virtual um, uh, images rather than real people. Uh, in the UK, there's been a lot of uh, attention given to developing medical students and trainees to integrate well with patients. When you first encounter a patient, you approach the patient, you introduce yourself, you check the, on the patient's name, um, you look them in the eyes, you give them focused attention, and you often touch them. You put a hand on a hand, just briefly. But that introduces a very important content, uh, contact which is part of the doctor, patient, student, patient experience. Of course, touch needs to be appropriate, but I think you get the point. We're not gonna get this as we move further and further forward with technology. Touching a robot is not gonna be the same as touching a patient. This is gonna be a vital thing that we need to consider. Okay, the student experience has to be core. 
Um, we're quite focused on our research, you know, getting the best evidence out there in order, in order that we should treat the patient. But do we have the student experience at, uh, at the heart of what we're considering? Does it matter to us whether we teach the student or the doctor or the emergency medicine trainee in a room that has no windows? Or do we understand that teaching them in a room that has windows is an analogy, is not to be taken literally. In a room that has windows, the environment is key for their learning experience. Um, do we have that understanding? Is the student and the patient experience core? There's a very interesting professor by the name of Christian Simsarian, who is a professor of design technology. And uh, one day he feigned a foot injury. He went into his local emergency department as a patient and said he'd sprained his ankle and he's having difficulty walking. And he videoed the whole experience in the emergency department. He spent hours sitting in a cold waiting room with little information about what to expect, um, about what his condition was. The room was heavily overcrowded, warm, um, noisy, smelly. And as time went by, he began to get a bit anxious. He was a uh, fit, young, young, relatively young adult. And he wondered, I, I wonder what this is going to be like for an elderly person or a slightly disabled person or for someone who's really got an injury, who's really in pain, um, who's really anxious about their potential cancer or heart attack or stroke or whatever. I wonder what this is going to be like. And he left the, he left the room and he put together a team that began to look intensively at the whole experience. And um, I don't want to go through this uh, in great detail, but the whole concept of design thing is starts with empathy. Doesn't start with facts and figures and evidence base. It starts with some feeling of the patient and some feeling of the student and some feeling of the emergency trainee. And he looked at this and began to define the elements. And then as a group, they talked about this and they, they related uh, one to another and began to put together a plan that would improve the whole experience, the experience, not the facts, the experience um, of, you know, uh, the emergency department, emergency uh, patient trainee uh, uh, interaction. Now, Hong Kong U has a vision, a 10-year vision, and uh, it's uh, four points, three plus one. And the third part of this vision is interdisciplinarity. And I think we're often quite proud. We're the doctors. We know, you know, we know environment. No one else knows our environment like we do. And so we don't engage with, you know, people who don't know environment. Um, uh, this is a very common medical perspective. Why get engineers in? Why get uh, psychologists in? Why get a, a social, um, a, a person with expertise in social uh, uh, understanding, social behavior, societal behavior to help us to work out how to improve our teaching? Why do that? I think there's a very good reason. I think they may help us to improve our whole education. So, the future, I think, depends partly on learning from the past and anticipating the future as best we can. I'll come to that in a minute, uh, a little bit later. Learning is what matters most, more than teaching. Um, I think often our focus is to make sure that I'm teaching well, I'm getting a good delivery, I come out with good marks. Um, but it's not really teaching that matters, it's learning. It's, where, it's whether the students, whether the emergency trainee, whether the doctors are learning appropriately is what matters most. The people who learn the most are the people who teach the most. So in order for our emergency trainees and our, our medical students uh, and our, our colleagues of the future to learn the most, 
should we be encouraging them to teach the most and we guide them rather than teach them and tell them what they should be doing? Uh, my understanding is that this is the model in Oxford. Um, there's very little lectures in Oxford. Um, there's a lot of uh, sustained personal teaching. Of course, it's well financed. There's a lot of one to one to or one, or one to two, one to three small group interaction. And this is what generates the high quality um, doctors of the future. Adult education, different from child education, is where adults are involved in their own self education. Often during the COVID crisis, I've heard our, our senior teachers in the faculty talk about the babies, the children, talking about medical students, first, second, third, fourth, fifth year medical students. They are all adults. They are all over 18. To us, they may be babies, but they're not. I engage with some of our medical students in doing a long-term elective. Their insight, their intelligence is profound. I learn more from them than they learn from me. And my role is guidance rather than saying, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, this is what you should do. They actually, they're adults. Um, Colin raised a fascinating issue really uh, that um, uh, we have gone through uh, in Hong Kong um, over the last two years where uh, medical students are banned from emergency departments um, for any risk period whatsoever. It's far too dangerous for them. Uh, we need to protect them. Um, I mean, what happens if they got COVID? What happens if they introduce COVID into emergency department? Um, and as the hospital has opened up more and more uh, to admitting medical, uh, uh, med medical students to uh, the wards, the one place they mustn't go is the emergency department. Before I came to Hong Kong in 2020, I spent nine months in the UK working in emergency departments in South Wales. Medical students were encouraged to go into emergency departments. They were employed and paid to function as extra hands. They worked in the cold area and the hot area. They were adults. If there was a world war, they would be on the front line. They wouldn't be in cotton wool sitting in, if, if there was a world war, because there's a pandemic, they're completely separated from it. When, uh, during my, my years in, 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 in medical school in uh, Cardiff, the mortality rate amongst medical students in my year was 3.5%. The mortality rate from COVID is 2%. By rational thinking, no one should go into medicine. It's far too dangerous how it's gonna affect you psychologically and the pressure and the pain and whatever else it does, my goodness. When I was in Cardiff, there was one medical student who signed up. He wanted to be in the hot area all the time. I actually had to stop him and share out the experience so others got a chance. It is so completely different from Hong Kong. Uh, it is, blows my mind when I think about the comparison. Now, I'm not here to say what's right or what's wrong, okay? But I will give you an opinion. My opinion is the British medical student will qualify much, much, much better trained to face the future than the Hong Kong medical student, much better. You can think about it. So what's the future for emergency medicine education? Well, people learn better when there is a cost to not doing so. People learn even better when they can see the benefit. And as adults, they need to know why. They need to know why something's important. It's not just you do it because I told you. It's why. This is much more meaningful. So we need to listen. We need to interact. We need to understand students, doctors, patients much better.
and identify opportunities for improvement. My hero, being a religious guy, being a Christian, my hero is Jesus Christ. Um, for others, it may be Confucius. Uh, for mother, others, it may be um, Amel Machu or, or, or some uh, other wonderful uh, uh, leader in, in emergency med medicine education. What fascinated me about the greatest teacher of all time is the issue of discipleship. If you really want to train people for the future who will carry on your mission of emergency medicine or whatever it is, you need to recruit them, invest intensively in with them, with them, be on the shop floor, be at the coal face, talk to them, model for them, and you integrate them. You don't shun them away and give, well, they didn't have videos in those days. I mean, uh, but I've got a feeling that even if they did have videos and virtual reality and apps and simulations, I don't think they'd be buying them. I think the greatest teacher of all time would be going out to the coal face in the emergency department and said, come with me and I'll make you emergency medicine, fishers and men and disciples of the future. So these are the principles of discipleship, people-centered, service-centered. In their context, it was God-centered, but here, emergency medicine. So in conclusion, the way forward, Unprecedented, unprecedented challenges, no doubt. Technology is going to be there, no doubt. Whether you like it or not, uh, we need, I believe, an interdisciplinary uh, disciplinarity approach. We need design thinking, but most of all, if we are to retain the real talents that we've had amongst our emergency trainees, and as Colin said, are leaving, we need discipleship. We need to invest in them in a personal way, intensively, for the future. And then I think we will benefit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Rainer.